it's a little different. It definitely flows from uh, Jerry, I think Jerry Patterson's work. Um, Sean, no coincidence, was a, uh, a student of Jerry's. And um, he kind of took it another step uh, further, incorporating the work of uh, Bill Miller and motivational interviewing. Uh, number one, like a lot of parent management approaches, including incredible years, PCIT, um, they all come from the same tree of Gary Hodges in, in the forest there in Eugene. Um, addressing adult leadership um, and trying to link services uh, to family management and child adjustment. So, if uh, how many of you have seen a family where there's a two year old and the two year old is running the show? Yes. Try to change that. Hierarchy is very important to establish that. Number one, uh, probably a, a, at least a formal difference, if not an informal one. Uh, from family check, from other interventional you know, analysis like this, we do a careful, uh, rather intensive assessment because we're going to use that assessment to join with the parent, right? Number one, but also give them feedback about what's going on compared to other kids your child age, whether it's an early adolescent or a toddler, over time. So we're going to take, use that to our advantage to build some distance between what the parent wants for their child and what's going on right now. The deck is kind of rigged because you know, they take you if the things you don't like are going on with your child and your family. It's motivational. We incorporate a Miller's motivational interviewing. It's a core component from the first phone call, the first contact we have with you to try to create that dissonance again and move it to get people to think about change. We're recruiting families from WIC waiting rooms who are there to do one thing, get out of there as soon as possible so they can get their back. Okay, that's where this started. Pediatrics is a dream come true because parents may not want to be there with a sick child, but they, unlike WIC, they trust the pediatrician, which has been said repeatedly, and you'll see that in our engagement book. Um, it's tailored. We use, the next point is about um, strength-based, and then we get to health maintenance. So I'm gonna, the tailored and health maintenance are, are, are related, though, because we average about three to four sessions, including what we're doing per year, okay? We zoom in on what we see as parent strengths and things they want to work on, and say, what would you like to do? Including, never see you again in your life, right? I mean, that's fine, we take that, because they're gonna get the feedback of what's going on, things they want. But they also might want to work on two or three brief sessions, or like Angela I mentioned earlier, she gets families for 18 sessions, or 10 sessions, depending. So it's going to vary based on the family and the interventionist and what's going on right now. But, un but unlike some other uh, uh, interventions, we're going to put that next year and see how's it going again. If only to corroborate that things are going well, and it's still going well, or things have gotten worse, then we'll work on that for two or three sessions, whatever. But it's very brief. It's much treating like diabetes or dentistry. It's not surgery. Somewhere along the line, we got this idea that uh, families have stressors. We can come in 10, 15 sessions and, and cure them for the rest of their lives. I'm not sure how that happens, but it doesn't seem to, to make a lot of sense from, from where I sit and working with our mostly low-income families. Like, should have mentioned this, all pretty much low-income families. It's very much strength-based. So even though uh, we're working with families uh, who have a lot of issues going on, we're going to show the video of this, things going well and say, how can we make this happen more often? All right, so in terms of how it works, we have an initial interview. This is in the real world. Initial interview followed by an assessment, and then we get feedback. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that. And then that could be it. That could be it, or it could turn into uh, parent management training, PMT, could turn into child CBT, if it was like a 12 or 13 year old, or it could be a referral. Some of our parents are depressed and want meds. We'll refer them to a psychiatrist if they want that. Some want Section 8 housing, we'll do a little bit of work to help them get that. Um, but a lot of the work, we try to make it a family issue because that's our forte. We try not to transfer the parent to somewhere else. In our research studies, because we want the people blinded who are assigned, we'll put this initial interview sometimes after this. In the our current study we're doing, the first study, we actually combine these two into one session. So it's actually just two sessions. At the end of the assessment, we actually start this uh, get to know session. All right. These are just some, uh, this is not a new intervention. It's not as old as incredible years, but it's pretty old. And this is uh, going back in early childhood. Two things I want you to notice. Uh, look at the length of outcome. This is all the way from age two, seven years out, five years out, three years out, things like that. All kinds of problem behavior, including the MI, JD, up here, that study here. If we change parenting in early childhood, all kinds of good things seem to happen from this 
uh, longitudinal trial, a WIC sample, by the way, uh, over, and you can see not just with the kids, but moms and uh, parent-child conflict, uh, academic achievement, again, can change parent. It's all about changing that climate, emotion regulation skills over time. I want you to notice this rate, engagement. Actually, we got up to 90% over three or four years, but at any one time, I think the highest was 73% at age two. This was uh, asking parents at WIC to get engaged in this, okay? And which is not a very, at least in Pittsburgh, of 13 and now seven centers around, not a very hospitable place. Once in a while, they have immunization clinics and breastfeeding, but that's not the norm. This is the um, adolescent version of that, that great. Indeed, we're involved in these studies um, as well. 25 to 50% in PALS 1 involving, I believe, 999 uh, uh, young adolescents and wonderful outcomes. Look at this, all the way to age 22, 23 on substance use, et cetera. Average of six sessions over that time of family. I'm talking over five or six days to six sessions. Um, and, uh, but you can see not everyone, this was school-based, and then in schools, uh, only 25% in the first study and got up to 50% when they were visiting homes in the second version of this. So it's good, but we can improve on it, right? Good idea. So family checkups have been used in these multiple settings over time, and now we're in Pittsburgh, we're at, at uh, Family Support Centers, uh, CYF, which is getting better intervention at uh, child youth, and but pediatrics is clearly uh, my favorite at this point. So let me introduce you to the first step, a few minutes. Um, this is the idea of going back to adolescence, in fact, with Sean started the work, but instead of working in schools, we're embedding ourselves in primary care, right? And this is combining, the idea here is how can we get parents more active to take more advantage? A lot of them live in very high risk neighbors. This is all uh, Pittsburgh, about 79% African American, the rest mostly white or, or biracial. And you can see the theory here, safeguarding, you don't use monotone, you use safeguarding. Uh, kids from other risky environments, including peers and neighborhood processes. Uh, building, again, on strengths on the parent-child relationships, and getting parents to just be more active in their kids' lives, particularly Monday through Friday from 3 to 6.30 in the afternoon when things are, are getting up. My collaborator, this is Ty right now, who developed a screen based on the work of a group in Pittsburgh led by Ralph Carter. They've been looking at items from scales that actually predict substance use in early adolescence. Ty took this and turned this into a user-friendly screening device. When I say user-friendly, I mean the abridged version, which you can give in about seven minutes, uh, and it, it, it picks about 20 items. And I'll show you an example. And what's cool about it is that because it's on headphones, you can hear it, there are images that go with it, as well as seeing it, kids don't mind doing it, and they have privacy in a way. Uh, user-friendly does not mean the abridged version, which is 360 items. And so, even though our kids survive the assessment, they get about 160 item version. When they find out they have to do it, the second assessment, the uh, pain expression on the face is like, I can't tell you. Uh, we have videotape, though, if anybody wants to see that. Um, but you can imagine 20 items of this, it takes about seven or eight minutes to do. Um, Lord has mentioned how uh, we have to uh, do a dance in between different uh, service providers and agencies. So that seven minutes might take 40 minutes between everything else because it's a resident uh, facility, so you have residents and medical students in, so things go up and down in terms of, but this is kind of, I know you can't read the writing, but these are kind of the images they see. Notice it isn't all about conduct problems or emotional problems, but coping, distractibility, susceptibility, peer influence. Parents are also filling out just a short questionnaire on the child's problem behavior. If either one gets above a certain range, they get in the study, okay? What happens? This is the Alexa, the screen. Uh, it's, uh, PCC is the name of the pediatric center. We're now working also at a faith-based uh, center in downtown Pittsburgh, too, uh, and screening there. And every place is slightly different. Lord has talked about it's very different and you have to navigate those waters. If you're interested, uh, you complete the screen and family get a randomly assigned to a family checkup or a weightless control. Or after one year, you would get the family checkup. That way you can see what happens in that intervening year. Some families get the family checkup a second time, others only once. Um, they then, it's interesting here, so this is, this I would say the two studies I present, this one is less integrated because here the work is done all at the family's home which is really cool if you don't like coming into the center, but if you really care about it and feel safer there, you can see there are pluses and advantages of that, right? A lot of our families appreciate how it's going to deliver. 
and then we do follow-up treatment uh, there in the real world. This is kind of what happens as they come in the waiting room. Research nurse flags the families, the practice death uh, requests current permission for nurse to introduce Sky to study. They introduce it. If eligible, they administer the screen. And when I say nurse, we're actually using the research assistant we started budget wise the nurse. Found that research assistants are cheaper. Um, this is actually a design of the study. They get recruited and passed on to Sky the day of the so these are well child visits. They can be mildly sick and we'll still see them. Uh, they can fill it out. Then they get this random assignment and then immediately they get uh, either family checkup or this control group you're on. And I think for purposes of this presentation, I'm going to move on. This is less important. So here are the lessons learned so far. And again, uh, echo both of Joyce and Lourdes a lot. I mean, I, I don't think there was one thing I disagreed with in terms of priorities that we were setting up. The challenge was here. Uh, one that Joyce was very explicit about is you need a champion on the unit there. And it's funny, we have the same champion for both studies, right? We have a vote in Pittsburgh, but she's much more into the infant study. So we have to do more effort to make sure they're aware. I mean, she lives for infants, so uh, you know, even the same family might be, there might be some differences there. Uh, Buy-in, uh, frontline staff essential, again, brought up in the previous uh, talk, and we worked at that, we had a meeting early this week uh, to talk about to reintroduce the staff. It turned out we talked to the pediatricians a lot, but not the staff so much. Don't forget that, they're the ones that control uh, whether they're gonna uh, talk up or talk down or just be uh, neutral about it. Um, what we've noticed, and this is just a commentary on our society more than anything else, but these 10 to 13 year olds we're dealing with are a hell of a lot more challenging than ever. I mean, the pessimism that invades our uh, parents, but also our staff, and keeping morale up for our staff, with our, maybe it's just in Pittsburgh, but our 10 to 13 year olds are really facing challenges. A lot of suicidal ideation we've never seen before in terms of our frequency. The good parts. It's funny, we saw this uh, exact figure by Borders, 93% engagement rate, and yes, here with adolescents. Your recall is 25 to 50% in the school, in the uh, study, and I don't think it's that it's Oregon, I think it's that it's pediatrics uh, here, and that the, uh, our assessors are our interventions in the study. So they're going home, and even though it's kind of mundane work, they're connecting already when they do that first visit. So we have some really good interventions. Uh, we have some preliminary findings on half the sample of one year out compared to the control group we're going to get, and we're seeing some good uh, findings on tobacco use as well as monitoring, uh, not, so, not surprisingly. Challenges, incorporating intervention staff into practice. What's ironic about this is that we have a very progressive uh, system, or UPMC system, and, and they actually have interventionists on our unit right now, ready and willing to use this, uh, what we want to see the works we're being conservative, but as, as soon as we find that out, we actually have set up the way to use this in the real world, which is really promising if we continue finding uh, things. Uh, billing for insurance, when we started it, this idea, and you know, you'll appreciate this, uh, you know, affordable care was around, and you could get reimbursed, right, for kids who are at risk for substance use. So it was built into our system. That is, of course, shifting, the sands are shifting. We'll see if that's still around a year from now, if and when we find the intervention is effective. And then, as I mentioned before, maintaining enthusiasm uh, for the PDF and stuff. Okay, I'm gonna put that seven minutes or something like that. Five. About five. I'm gonna introduce the second study, and um, this is uh, called Smart Beginnings. And again, uh, this was uh, brought up, uh, Joyce brought this up, about uh, trying to have an effect at the population level, um, early and frequent contact, and again, I'm preaching to the choir here about pediatrics being a vehicle. I think uh, it's also a note, and this is from my colleague, Alan Mendelson, but Reach Out and Read is a very underutilized program. You know, it's reached uh, 3.9 million in 5,000 sites in the USA. How does that happen? You know, it's at a place where families already are. I used to be a street photographer. It was really interesting to think about where you shoot uh, families or people. You go where they their cabins, whether it's a barber shop or looking at the Lincoln Memorial or whatever. I mean, it really helps to go to where the crowd is. And this is really true. They come here with a positive attitude uh, towards uh, pediatrics. It's really important. We know that about 25 to 30 percent of all low-income families in the U.S. are actually using something like reach out, which is really cool. 
Ah, uh, so bad uh, choice of yellow there. Um, the Video Interaction Project was founded by a pediatrician, a developmental pediatrics person named Alan Mendelson, and he extends Reach Out and Read to get families to actually get videotape while playing with a new toy during their well checks when they're already coming in at one month, two months, I believe, uh, three or four months, six months, nine months, and 12 months. 15, 15 times over the first five years that they come in. The sessions are brief. Immediately upon playing with the toy videotape, they get feedback on how to use the toy better and things that are already doing well. And he has, have, he has really nice data showing two and three years out that this is related to all kinds of um, gains, not only in cognitive, but school readiness, but paternal depression. And, and, and child externalizing problems. So we're, what we're doing here, the other, other piece I'll comment on is that whether it's working with an individual family uh, or working with an agency or working with a collaborator, adaptation is key here. So here are two evidences where we've adapted the family checkout with a screen or with a whole other intervention. Um, but that you go in, just like the deal saying, you will go in and you find out what families really need and what your collaborator really wants to do, and you work from there. And this is what happens uh, when you combine forces. So we got this grant to do uh, collaborative studies, the same uh, protocol at Bellevue Hospital in New York City, so we primarily Latino families, about 79%, 21% African American, in Pittsburgh, about 80% African American, and we're combining this universal, so everyone gets, uh, gets a randomly assigned intervention, gets VIP, right, this video interaction problem. And then we do a screen at six months, and this could be done in, um, uh, in, in a very short time, because we have NIH funding, we're actually doing a whole lab visit at the hospitals in both sites. And then if they're above a certain threshold on lack of literacy or maternal depression or child irritability, they get a family checkup on top of it. Okay? So whereas VIP uses video feedback, we also address in the family checkup things that get in the way of families in an optimal uh, situation. Uh, and we're extending the age period here. Family checkup had previously only been used up to age two, and now we're going downward at six months over time. And this is, uh, I'm going to skip this slide because it's uh, wordy, but essentially you have random assignment into these two group, uh, groups, intervention or control. And if you have the intervention, everyone gets this universal, but only some families are going to qualify for family checkups. So far, it's about 45 to 50 percent of what they want over time. So, last slide. Lessons learned. Uh, <laughs> Learning to take advantage, we have two great interventions here. One has BA or BS level training, that's the VIP person, right? And then they hand the person to the family checkout, the families that are talking. This has been a wonderful collaboration because we can actually use videotape clips from the video interaction project to reinforce strengths that they started talking about. There's inherent trust in the um, VIP person. In fact, we're getting them to come back for the well checkup. Uh, anecdotally more often, because they establish a relationship, whereas the pediatrician, although very kind of benevolent, may not be the same person every time in a, uh, a medical a training facility like a uh, kid has. Um, VIP staff were somewhat surprised that families qualified. So families they thought that were really together, turns out they're depressed. But because VIP is narrow, the interventionist is someone just with the college level, they're not crying and nesting about things that are getting way at the parent all the time. Also, because it's home-based, especially in New York City and our recently immigrant population there, we have families literally living in a space uh, between the door and here, three different families living in this space right now, hiding from the government uh, if necessary. I mean, just different kinds of poverty than you would imagine that, that we had in, in Pittsburgh over time. Uh, again, uh, similar to our other rates, we're getting an engagement rate for VIP of greater than 90 percent because it's there. I mean, they literally have to say no to their faces before they're, while they're waiting in the waiting room. So it's really easy. 65 of 69 families in Pittsburgh have had at least one VIP session. And interestingly, dads, I don't know dads can go out too much today, but about 27 percent of these sessions include fathers, sometimes fathers alone. Um, that handoff is now happening in Pittsburgh, where about 85% of slightly more challenging families, if they qualify, 
we're still engaging about 85% and 57% have included fathers in those sessions, which is really cool. Again, no intervention plans yet, but we're really upbeat about this uh, project and its uh, ability to maybe move to other uh, locations over time. So I'm here from the military. We're working with the U.S. Air Force right now with uh, 11 bases around the country to try to do more preventive care. Uh, finally, challenges uh, supporting VIP staff. We have this sole family checkup person in New York and a sole VIP person in Pittsburgh. So trying to make sure they're taken care of uh, is very important. I think I'll leave it at that.